Well, hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinga, and this is episode number 369. That's Tres Says Nuevo. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, just trucking in on there. Got me a little water here, chilling, vibing, enjoying life. <sighs> if it's your first time listening to the show, please make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, click the link in the pinned comments down below. That's patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. For little as one dollar per month, you can get access to my entire audio library as well as over 300 Three hundred shows on there, right? As well as this podcast, actually in full before it comes out anywhere else. So make sure you jump on to the Patreon. Don't delay. Join today. Okay, cool, amazing. But yeah, man, here we are back again, isn't it? Doing a damn thing. Um, going um one step further than mankind. All that malarkey, right? When they land on the moon, doing all that madness. Uh, big up everyone out there right now, hanging on there, hanging in for dear life. What's been happening? That's new. Oh, I'm training again, right? I'm I'm running and training regularly. Um, I put on a couple of COVID pounds over this, you know, prolonged lockdown that doesn't seem to have any kind of end in sight. So naturally, I'm having to now shed those pounds in order to kind of fit into the clothes I like to wear. <laughs> you know, just for pure vanity's sake. You know, you can't um, um, you can't like the clothes. Oh yeah, you can't wear the clothes that I like to wear and be on um, the heavier side of things, right? You kind of have to be a bit slivet, a bit svelte, um, a little bit trim. So, um, oh, and also, what did I get? No, I got inspired by actually um, the Mike Tyson interview with Joe Rogan recently. Um, like, crucial viewing. Make sure, if you haven't watched it yet, just make sure you check it out. Of course, Mike is back in the news because he's scheduled to fight Roy Jones in November. I think the day he's been rescheduled to. Um, it's supposedly meant to be a launch of some Legends League they're going to be promoting. Mike Tyson mentioned in the Joe Rogan podcast, they're going to do other sports. So you're going to see, you know, Legends in tennis and athletics facing off each other on one-off events, which is pretty cool. Um, I think if you've watched any kind of sports documentary or if you've had any friends that have played high professional level sports or if you even just did, you know, play sports yourself, you'd know how addictive it is. You know, being in a locker room, hanging out with people, going to play different, going to different places, especially traveling with your sport and kind of growing as a person. So when they retire, I'm not surprised a lot of these sports men, sports women find it very difficult to kind of, you know, um, go about their life like an average everyday civilian, right? And you find it a lot more with fighters usually, right? Because I think obviously there's always somebody willing to kind of pay you a ridiculous fee just to kind of, you know, essentially get more brain damage for their entertainment. But you don't necessarily get, you know, um uh rich arab dudes throwing money at bloody you know mark hughes to go play a, a five-a-side football match in it that's not a thing but i think if you spoke to most professional athletes regardless of what sport they're in they definitely tell you that they miss the days you know when they could go on tour when they were hanging out with their teammates when they were winning competitions or just competing in general so i think the addition of this kind of legends league will be very very welcome for a select few of people who kind of miss that kind of competitive um, element in their life so that looks really good but of course if you've watched Joe Rogan podcast you'd know Mike Tyson was on there what maybe two years ago I'm gonna say maybe a year and a half and he was very zen very mellow he was basically talking about all his regrets when it comes to fighting and how he regretted even doing it in the first place and he hates thinking about that person that he was when he turned in when he, he he hates kind of thinking about who that guy was and you know he can't even look himself in the mirror sometimes or blah blah, blah. it was just a very introspective version of mike tyson but this version of mike tyson sitting across joe rogan was not that guy he was intense laser focused that is i think someone put a compilation together of all the moments where uh, mike tyson told joe rogan he wasn't joking right and gave him that kind of like dead man stare right like hey 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 hey, hey. a couple times right? i mean you had to kind of set him straight and you like you felt scared for joe even though joe can look after himself you're like bloody hell mr rogan what are you doing man it's mike tyson you're sitting across from so that was pretty cool to see how he basically has to switch into that mode in order to kind of get back to fighting but he looks in incredible shape and he spoke about how um uh difficult it was getting back into shape but just the necessary the the necessity to get back into shape in order to kind of activate that you know 
killer mindset that he has going into the fight and of course you know i'm not gonna go kill anybody i'm not gonna eat anyone's babies and i'm definitely not gonna go punch anybody in a ring but um just in general just to make sure i'm in tip-top physical and mental condition i always find it in my experience anyway the fitter that i usually am the better my am mentally even though i read a lot you know i'm i spend about what an hour to two hours a day reading books and whatever they may be you know that's all well and good but um i find that the physical does complement the mental a lot in my experience anyway waking up early in the morning like today i went for a run at like six in the morning came back three mile run um did some work and then went back to the gym at like what six again so i did a double session today so my back is absolutely killing me so if you see me squirming in my chair don't worry i don't have um um i don't have a collapsed prolapse or anything right oh it's just me and my back's a bit tweaked but i always found whenever i did that i was on my peak performance so i'm gonna try and replicate it now um the goal is to lose what 50 pounds by the end of what november october let's say october yeah we say october for now um i've done it before so it's no big deal for me oh my god you can't do that it's still gonna be long uh, i don't need advice don't give me advice i, I know what i'm doing because whenever you mention something like this people always kind of give you pointers and stuff like i don't need the advice leave me alone um but i've done it before and um, the the question is just kind of keeping it off really in it um i've i've got i think my lowest because i think what now i don't know how do you, def- you have to calculate this i can't bother so pounds wise at the moment i think it's about i'm about 240 right I think in pounds. I don't know what that is in stone to stone. What is that? But 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 which is about seventeen stone. And the the lightest I've been at the time, I think it was maybe two years ago, was about twelve stone. So the goal is of course to get to about two hundred by the end of October, I'm saying yeah. So it's just basically losing three stone, which isn't too bad to be honest. Considering the way that I work out and considering how disciplined I can be when it comes to eating and stuff, it should be okay. Um, eating wise, diet wise is probably the most important thing. What am I doing for the diet? I am doing uh, oh, I'm basically doing keto for the most part. Uh, mixture of keto and primal and i'm doing of course the fasting um with the zero app so doing 16 8 so 16 hours fasting eight hours eating window which is pretty decent for me um i don't really you know i don't really spend that much time eating anyway i usually just eat for fuel um unless it's, unless i'm fucking gouging on croissants and biscuits but apart from that you know i'm a, it kind of helps i'm not a big foodie because I think that fasting for 16 hours would be very difficult if I was, you know, obsessed with pasta and stuff like that, which I like to eat, don't get me wrong, but it's not, it's not my, you know, it's not something I dream about. So that's basically what I'm doing for now. So that's going to keep me occupied. And um, it's been fun. And I guess especially with the winter months, you know, coming up and COVID is still not being eradicated in the UK. We're going to be spending a lot more time indoors. You know, people still working remotely. Um, yeah, man it's so best best time to kind of get in shape and to kind of maintain a good base heading into the winter time so that's basically my mo going forward talking about updates on corona uh, a funny funny a, a funny interesting little article popped up you know these articles that you know you look at you like duh you know it's like common sense or just you know of course this is happening and this is a headline from The Guardian. It says, coronavirus uh, rise in the UK cases because people have relaxed too much. Now, um, most people in the UK, especially if you live in a pretty busy area, you'd know that this has been happening, what, for like maybe months now? I think maybe since the, I'm going to say since, I'm going to say since July, end of July, this has been happening. You go to shops, people don't really obey the distancing rules. People are wearing masks, you know, on their chin, you know, hanging from one ear. People are just talking to friends and other randoms on the street with no protection and just being close to each other and all this sort of nonsense in it, right? And you're like, what's going on? Like, uh, am I in lockdown on my own or is, is this thing over? And I guess for some people, they've just, you know, they've hit that wall. They've got, um, what do they call it? They've got um, lockdown fatigue or something they call it, right? I think that's a term they're kind of using at the moment. Which is funny because all the places that have lockdown fatigue, the ones that are just complaining the most are the places where they haven't really had a full lockdown, right? You look at the UK and you look at North America. They had like a partial lockdown, but not the full sort of like enforced lockdown that they had like in Spain and Italy where they had literally police patrolling the streets telling you to get back into your house if you're indoors that didn't happen here um it was just kind of like suggested you know if you don't mind if it wouldn't be too much hassle 
you know, could you just, you know, scurry on indoors, please, sir, madam? It's like, what? Bruv, people are dying, man. You know what I mean? The economy is on its knees, right? <laughs> Kids are going like, you've got Marcus Rashford arguing with, you know, MPs about giving kids free school meals. Like, it's not the best situation you're telling, you're suggesting if it's going to people to stay inside. So that's, that's just funny seeing these sort of headlines, isn't it? But the other bit I think was interesting was the fact that they mentioned supposedly young people are to blame um, regarding it, which is interesting because um, I think they try to blame it at what? Like affluent, more affluent people? Where is it? Yeah, here. Um, so it says, while the lockdown, let's get rid of the thing. It said, um, while the lockdown um, has been mainly concentrated in poorer areas, Hancock said this had now changed. He said, the recent increase we've seen in the last few days is more broadly spread. It's um, actually among the more affluent younger people where we have seen the rise. Now, I don't know what he means by affluent. I don't know if he means affluent like him affluent, like eat and educate affluent, or if he just means young people that have, you know, disposable income affluent. Because if that's the case, I, I agree. You know, you look at, you go to the, if you go to the Instagram, of, like what I did the other day, I went to the Instagram of Box Park and Shoreditch randomly, I just stumbled across it. And I just looked through the, some of the tech pictures and videos. Like, people are out, like outside, like for real, like drinking, dancing on their table, shouting and shit. Like it's not, it's not what you think, man, out there. But it's fucking wild. I thought the parks were worse. I thought the parks were bad in the beginning of the year when people like you know were crowding around in the parks and having kind of park braves and whatever there may be with their bluetooth speakers but this stuff now especially with all these pubs and bars popping up that are doing these kind of like covid safe raves where you book a table for two to six people and they have a dj playing and essentially you can dance but just on you and your table that's just essentially just a rave you might just open up the nightclubs in it and that's another one so what happens when they open up the nightclubs what happens when they re people return back to stadiums like the issue isn't even reopening them because I'm fine for them to reopen it. I think it's a good idea, right? The economy needs to restart. We need to get back to some level of normality because for the most part, we're not going to, no one's going to ever put up with another lockdown in this country. We're just, we're not made for it. We're not cut out for it. So we're going to have to just, you know, hope that by the time things open up, there's a bit of herd immunity going on and there's advances and there's come, there's some um, scientific advances in, uh, in the conclusion of this kind of you know of this vaccine right getting it ready and shipped and ready to you know to put in people's arms wherever it's going to be put but god damn it man and it continues here it says after almost three thousand people tested positive for covid19 on sunday 65 percent rise in a single day the highest daily toll since may hancock said the uk could soon start to see a renewed rise in hospital admission speaking on the phone in lbc hancock said it was virtually important it was vitally important for young people to take measures to avoid spreading the virus it's concerning because we've seen a rise in cases in france and in spain which ironically is all the places where the plague raves are taking place um, in some countries across europe and nobody wants to see a second wave here that's the interesting part though isn't it which is really difficult it's like the young people rising cases in covid makes sense because just imagine like being i always keep saying it because i think that's some people that i feel the worst for right i feel the worst for like parents with children like you know having to do homeschooling and stuff especially if your kids are like in i don't know early years of secondary school or even just primary school it's primary school probably more so and then i also feel feel bad for the kids that are like under 18 like you know you're not you're not quite like let's say let's say under 17 like imagine what it must be like being that age where you're essentially your whole life is consumed by your friends i remember being that age right my mom used to kind of get annoyed by it you just spend your whole life talking to your friends on the phone over chat hanging out with them everything's about your friends you don't care about anyone else but your friends your friends your friends your friends your friends and then suddenly bang you can't see them anymore especially if you grow up in a house where you don't have because i imagine especially for, for me and most of my friends in ends you don't really have much entertainment at home now maybe it's different because you know most kids have smartphones back in the day like what do you have if you're lucky if you had a console right less lucky and then and then it depends if you've had games, right? Because nowadays, if you've got a console, you can, you know, you could probably get some cracked game online or you could get a whole collection of games sent to you. There's always ways around it. But back in the day, you had to have a CD or a cartridge. So you might only have two or three games on you, but you can't see your friends. And also your computer, your console doesn't have connectivity to the internet unless you have a Dreamcast or something, right? There's no internet on that shit. So you're playing it by yourself against CPU. It's just you and CPU all day long. Because usually, you know, your brothers or siblings, you know, they probably get bored of playing you and they just go and do their own thing. So you're just there staring at the screen, talking to no one, doing nothing, just mindlessly playing this game against a computer. But oddly enough, I do think 
maybe maybe it's a very bad assumption i would say maybe that era of gamer was probably a lot better than the era of gamer now playing against a cpu is that could that be said maybe the kids are bit, I, I don't know but regardless man i just feel sorry for those kids at that age but again can you really stop young people from gathering and meeting up with each other isn't that part of being young meeting your friends hanging out chatting shit right getting up to trouble like you know causing a bit of a ruckus that's what it means to be young so it's virtually impossible i imagine a lot of parents too would be like you know i want to be a respite man just leave the house so i mean just fed up of like stepping over your shit bumping into you in a hallway just get out get out do you know what i mean like even if it, even during covid like you know what i don't care get out put a mask on make sure you call me every hour or whatever it may be but just get out so yeah i can only imagine so good luck to the government trying to sort that one out mate good luck in it and then the other uh, really funny story was this story that supposedly um boris visit the, the schools that boris visited um in order to kind of promote this uh schools are covid safe um what it says here the headline it says uh the school that boris visited to show um was safe closes due to coronavirus days after visit <laughs> Oh, absolutely hilarious man um it says here uh, pupils at the castle rock high school in coville leicestershire were told to stay at home and isolate after a confirmed case of the virus six tutor groups and two PE teacher classes were told to stay at home and wait for further instructions from the school to confirm how long they need to stay away Johnson visited the school in August 26 as it reopened. He gave the speech saying that the biggest risk to children was not the virus, but continuing to be out of school, which it might be true. And I guess that's the painful decision a lot of politicians have to make in it, right? You're going to have to get to a point where you have to just say to yourself, like, which they're probably having these conversations now at the moment, in House of Commons behind closed doors, where they're like, you know what? How many deaths is justifiable for us to reopen the economy? Like, what's the number? There has to be a number. There has to be a figure of cases in schools that maybe lead to deaths. There has to be because you know they've got no other option and because i'm sure for as scary as it is for kids going back into school and for parents to send their kids to school during these times it's also like unnecessary it's necessary that kids go back to school right like learning especially because i'd imagine a lot of the schools much like society in general right you're seeing restaurants struggle at the moment i'd imagine schools just aren't built especially in schools in the uk they're not necessarily built in a way that could easily be tra that could easily be transferred online to zoom and stuff right they don't really have the syllabus isn't really made you know it's, it's hard enough trying to learn in a classroom let alone trying to learn you know with a teacher that doesn't really know tech that well or you know with just a really old beat up syllabus and course structure that doesn't really make any sense for the modern world and then trying to you know relay that through zoom it just doesn't really make sense and again it probably only benefits the kids that are like self-motivated anyway do you know what i mean i'd imagine the kids that actually need school that need that kind of um social pressure right just kind of attending a class and being in a certain set so you just perform because you don't want to be the dummy of the class do you know what i mean those kind of things those kids actually need that are the ones that probably suffer the most the the self-driven ones who kind of get stuff done anyway who kind of finish their homework before the weekend so they can go and play those kids don't are not going to suffer they're going to be fine but i think the majority are the ones that need the actual um you know the guide rails to kind of get them through so you can just imagine these sort of things being you know concerning for some parents but also some of them are like you know what we don't care man i'd rather send my kids to school and take the chances than you know have them be at home staring into staring at walls um but yeah just funny in terms of like he went these are the places that he actually went to and then they turned out to be the not covid safe oh this guy is like a walking virus isn't it god old boys you would have thought as well that that's a i think that's why i thought it turned that's where the tie turned for me in terms of coronavirus um you know relief or action plan or you know the change in kind of approach i felt it kind of went down a drain um when Boris got ill and he and nothing changed, do you remember? Because I thought when he got ill, I was like, okay, cool. Hopefully he gets better. I didn't want him to die, unlike some people on social, right? But I was like, okay, once he recovers, hopefully he kind of like sees, you know, hopefully he sees errors as of his ways and tries to kind of you know deal with the situation as seriously as possible. But he didn't. If anything, he came back and just doubled down, as most politicians do, right? Instead of trying to, instead of kind of learning from his near death experience, he just 
went back straight on what he was doing. No real change. If anything, he's probably taken more of a step back in terms of briefings and all that sort of stuff. He's not really in front of the camera that much. He does some obviously, you know, obvious kind of, uh, what are these called? Flipping propaganda um, visits, right? He does a lot of these, but in terms of talking to the British public in a kind of, you know, press conference type way, he doesn't do that anymore. He just leaves that to his cronies. Again, interesting way to govern. Um, but like I've said uh, plenty of times on here and just in private, um, things like this make me have kind of solidify my um perspective or pov that you should never oh yeah or my opinion that you should never ever feel inadequate for jobs you should never feel like you can't do a certain thing unless it's something very technical that you have absolutely no experience in but my but, but from my experience no pun intended all jobs really the only thing kind of separating somebody that's quote unquote a good performer or a high performer to somebody that isn't is just experience on the job right know-how right kind of um working on the fly you know kind of figuring out on the job that's anything that separates people honestly actual you know um actual intelligence or you know the ability to be creative the ability to kind of think out of the box these are things that you know they don't teach you when you're at work it's either you got it or you don't but unfortunately when you do go to a workplace the people that you bump into are usually the ones that sort of like try and fake the funk the most in it they're the ones that try and give you the impression that they know exactly what they're talking about. It's like, no, you don't. You don't know what you're talking about. You've just been here a couple of months or a couple of years longer than I have. And you've kind of patterned down this speech pattern that, you know, again, no pun intended, um, that kind of makes you sound like you've got your shit together. But you don't really know what you're doing. And this is proof, isn't it? Especially, you know, with this government, like they've handled this COVID stuff terribly. All the best stuff that's coming out in terms of resolving this, especially if you look at just around the world, has usually come from grassroots. Local communities sort of like chipping in and kind of figuring it out. Hey, how are we going to reopen this? How are we going to make this safe? Like they just figure out it's no government incentive, no state incentive, no local council, nothing. It's just mostly the local community, you know, sort of like gathering in place and just trying to figure stuff out so they can, you know, make sure they solidify the future of their families and shit. Absolutely madness, man. Oh, and talking about funny workplaces and talking about things that make me LOL, I saw this very, very interesting <laughs> tweet somebody shared earlier on today that was a, if anything, that kind of, it kind of gave me a bit of a, it was triggering, right? It reminded me of plenty of startups I've worked with over the years where, like I said, they just don't know what they're doing. Everyone's sort of like winging it. And I remember using, this guy used this phrase, um, Stu, who I used to work with, used this phrase, called them, what do you call them? chances it chances i think it's called chances because i think you know working on a few stuff with him you'd bump into a lot of these kind of media pr uh, um account manager types right who are just like i don't know like nothing really there was nothing special about them but their teams they, they there's nothing really interesting about them as people it was more so the people they seem to be adjacent to or standing yeah no right adjacent to or people that were in their orbit or like the access they had, that was basically what made them um, somebody, somebody, a desirable person you want to get in touch with. But as in terms of actual work, what they actually did day to day, I don't have a clue. They don't probably have a clue either. Um, but there was, but they're also the people that give you the most sass. They're the ones that kind of um, give you the most pushback, right? They're the ones that sort of like you know, ask for the moon and the stars, you know, when it comes to negotiating things. Just interesting, just as you see the level of entitlement. But I guess if you are because I think most people know when they are kind of bluffing it, right? Most people know, especially when you get, sometimes you might stumble in a job that you're probably not meant to have, right? But you're just bluffing it. But most people know, and they're kind of a bit humble in, in at least at least outwardly, right? Maybe inwardly you kind of tell yourself you're the shit, but at least outwardly you kind of, you know, there's a sense of humility. But these people, these psychos that I've kind of bumped into, similar to the video I'm going to show you, they don't have that they actually sometimes believe the shit that they come out with right they actually believe they believe yeah i'm 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 gonna change the world with this you know um the uber of pizzas or whatever bullshit app they've got started right i was like but this isn't uber it's like yeah no no you don't understand man this is for people that want stuff in two minutes not five it's like okay cool do your thing then do you know what i mean like and this is an example someone posted this on twitter so this is from some guy called jack wagner and supposedly it's um a hype house for adults so an adult content house supposedly some sort of company that does what 
that films viral content in some hidden hills mansion somewhere in the middle of LA. Like it, it looks really, really ridiculous. Let's play it here. But again, it reminds me of everyone I worked with. Our adult TikTok house called the Honey House. Sam is filming workouts for her YouTube channel and her Imagine living somewhere called the Honey House without wanting to slap yourself profusely every day you woke up before you get to work. Honey House. Can you think of any other name? I know all the other dumb ones are taking like swag and hype and drip. I don't know, whatever houses they've got. And it's for the kids too, right? It's, it's a bit r worded anyway, right? Seeing these kids dancing in front of, you know, TikTok cameras, right? Um, and they're not even dancing. It's just weird. It's not, it, you, would you even deem TikTok dancing? It's not even dancing. It's something else, isn't it? It's really performative, like the kind of mouthing and shit. It's just, you know, it's the kind of thing that back in the day you'd get bullied for, right? So back in the day, it's the kind of thing where if you had an old, you know, those old mitre balls, right? That were really levery, levery and kind of rippled all over the place. Loads of nice thick leather panels that were pumped up really hard. Like you, you went to you went to a petrol station, you pumped that ball up so it was rock hard. That's the kind of kid that would get that that ball straight to the face. Straight to the face, bang! Like, what are you doing, bro? What are you doing? Come play football, man. What are you dancing TikTok for, bro? <laughs> That's what it will be. <laughs> but this is absolutely her 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 hilarious. Her team is here shooting it. Nick works for a big time agency, and so he's always talking to brands and helping them. I'm sure most of it's a parody. Um, it has to be right. Big time agency talking to brands. What on the balcony, FaceTiming with? It's just yeah, oh God Almighty. And always, always, the brand and strategy dudes are like, <sighs> brand and strategy dudes are the ones that are always popping off to a loo when you go out and stuff night out, right? You know what the vibes are on that one, right? They're also the ones that are like never chipping in for that stuff, right? Number one, number two, sorry. They're also the guys who are like, talk a big game when in the office and then when they get out there, they're an absolute mess and a liability. And they're also the ones that are like, um, ambiguously aged, like this guy. He could be anywhere between 26 and 55, right? You have no idea. <laughs> With their marketing. B is a mindset and meditation coach, so she's always leading guide. Look, th does this girl even pay her own bills? And she's somehow a mindset and meditation coach. What's been the most stressful moment in her life? Losing her iPhone? Breaking up with her boyfriend? Dropping her scrunchie in the toilet? Like, come on. Really? Mindset. And this, this is not even a diss to her because I've been in that position, right? Where you're the kind of what? You're a course director. You're a program co-producer. You're like, what? What am I programming? Do you know what I mean? Right? I scraped by the tip in the skin of my teeth. And, you know, get me wrong. I, you know, I probably could apply myself more, but in school, I scraped, I scraped through every single grade <laughs> up until i got to uni maybe that was the only time i thought okay i actually enjoy the course that i'm doing right or maybe sixth form and, you know you pick your a levels that you actually like to you courses that you actually enjoy but prior to that like and i'm teaching people i did meditations on her computer aaron is an ecom wizard and lols uh, uh, look at aaron the ecom wizard supposedly look how quickly she minimizes one of her windows We've all been there, innit? When you're looking at stuff you probably shouldn't be looking at. <laughs> so she consults. Or maybe it's just Slack, so she's trying to pretend that she's doing work. I don't know what is going on there, but that's lulls, right? The minimizing of the window. And advises a lot of better for you brands, so she's always sitting here on her computer. She's, she advises other brands, right? E commerce assistant. Probably guess the amount of shops that she's opened. Do you think she even knows how to open a Shopify? Has she ma ever made a sale? Has she ever packaged anything? Send it out to post? taking product shots, written copy for a product, like legitimately try to pay rent selling items and then you're advising other brands to do the same thing. It's like, come on. Computer. You know, with your feet on the chair as well. Crushing it. Jared's a fitness trainer and he's also an actor. So if he's not reading his side. Of course he's an actor and a fitness trainer, but of course. He's working out and he's probably eating. Nick is a mindset. This is like a, you know what this could be like? Um, R.I.P. to him anyway. Well, R.I.P. But you know what I mean. But th this could be like a Crystalia sketch, him playing each of these characters, isn't it? Like it really, you could you could be that. Yeah, this really does remind me of every startup I've worked in, right? Random people on the phone. Look, they've got their um, what do you call them? They've got all their little stand-up notes, right, of stuff that they're working on.
moving it down like taking it off in the morning standing up going through what the task they're going to do just basically justifying your job you know it's like you're it's like you're it's like you're like you're about to get shot in in the morning you have to just justify everything you're doing right um, make it sound important stuff that doesn't really make it that hasn't really not ever going to move the needle you just got to justify your salary or the fact that you went out on the company card again yesterday <laughs> But this is all it is, just random people walking around talking on the phone. Especially especially imagine what it must be like. Thank God I'm not in the office now at the moment, right? Working remotely has been a blessing. But imagine what it must be like. It's working in a startup now with, with AirPods. It's worse enough having, you know, as bad enough as it was, you know, having people walking around with hands-free kits. But imagine with AirPods, how people, because people are already, you know, people when they get AirPods, they act, they, they, they switch up in it. Imagine what they're like now with AirPods in a startup, right? Like walking around in slippers, a pair of Birkenstocks, some high water jeans, right? Uh, a Starbucks coffee in one hand, or something from flat white, or something bougie like that. You know, talking in business code, sounding all optimistic about an app that no one wants. <laughs> Set and motivation coach, and so he's always firing people up on the phone. Oh yeah, man. And as well, like F, like FYI, not not that I give a shit, but like, how white is this house? Like, it's as white as the walls, isn't it? It's Caucasian to the max, bruv. Like, I mean, it's so Caucasian, you could call it couscous, bruv. It's mad. Evan and Dina are models Look. and fitness trainers, and if they're not doing a photo shoot, they're working out. Oh, okay, of course, that's, that's what all models do, innit? They just work out instead of just you know. Uh, developing some sort of eating disorder. That's what most models would just work out. Yeah, right. And then there's me. Of course. And doesn't he not look like every other founder that you've ever met at a startup? Doesn't he look like every other founder? Right? Doesn't he? Like, uh, it would want to be, um, what's that guy from WeWork? They've all got a similar sort of look in it, the WeWork founder, right? Floppy hair, mousy floppy hair, um, disingenuous, dead behind the eyes, smiles without moving of the eyes. Um, they probably swan in on a scooter. Uh, they have a kid that's named Max or a dog that's called Tyson. You know that kind of shit, right? They wear New Balances with no socks. Like <laughs> just flipping dances, man. Oh my god. Oh, uh, but big up the hype. But big up the Honey House, not the Hind House. The, the Honey House. Big up the Honey House crew. Do your thing in it. And of course, they're on TikTok with all these kind of cringy videos that I'm sure no one no one wants to watch. I'm just going to scan through them here. But, you know, you know the vibes, isn't it? Just mad Caucasian people smiling in cameras, um, purposely, white, you know, covering themselves in Vaseline and trying to make content that goes viral, isn't it? Look at it, that push-up bra, so you can click on nails, fingers, people running, fitness, squats wigs of course red cups because you know it's not a it's not social media content without red cups god almighty man pray for me pray for everybody but hey everyone's trying to live in it we're all trying to live next on people trying to live is this um fairly um combative interview with them um, six nine in the new york times that got me thinking um just about you know not about cancel culture, but about gatekeepers and um, street code and the hip hop industry and music in general. It just doesn't. It just kind of, kind of rubs me up the wrong way. So of course, you know, everyone's familiar with Six Nine's case, familiar with what kind of led up to his incarceration and you know what kind of proceeded, you know, after his release and all that malarkey. So there's no need to go over old ground. But this kind of interview, especially from the well, this interview from the New York Times was very combative, right? You felt as if the the interviewer was essentially um questioning six nines gangster trying to essentially get him to justify his existence you know and this is just some random interviewer dude who probably you know i don't know um buys his weed on online anyway do you know what i mean he's never really been in any kind of uh uh difficult position let's say a six nine has been in so for him to kind of sit there on his uh pulpit and kind of you know throw stones is a bit annoying but just on the topic of six nine in general it does make me feel a bit uneasy that the industry could essentially blackball him successfully just based off something that he did in the streets. Now, don't get me wrong. What he did is reprehensible and, you know, 
there's no way no one can condemn you know you deciding to purpose deciding with all consciousness to get involved with a very notorious street gang and then for you when it turns hot and you know it starts to get sticky for you and you start to face what six, 69 years ironically you then start singing like a bird and then try and justify it by claiming that your co-defendants were um had kind of you know slept with your baby mother and all this sort of nonsense right you know who cares about that stuff right you know what you know if you want to swim in swim in with sharks you know you're going to get bitten so it is what it is but putting that to one side the industry deciding that they're not going to support him based off something that he did in the streets really rubs up the wrong way because i feel like they pick and choose who the street code applies to because in most cases especially if you look at especially if you're familiar with any sort of gang history law or just you know you're familiar with watching documentaries on netflix and stuff you'd know that snitching unfortunately is part of the game um it's an unnecessary it's a it's an unfortunate part of the game but unfortunately with these guys who actually are real hardened criminals people who've devoted their lives to crime who have probably got themselves wrapped up in very serious things there is a real temptation for them to squeal and snitch on their co-defendants when it comes down to it because they're usually going to face you know um incarceration numbers in the double digits sometimes triple if it, depending on what they actually did so um snitching on your co-defender sometime isn't as it's not not snitching sorry isn't as easy a decision as it could be especially if you look if you took him from the civilian i can't imagine what it must be like involved in there right so it's obviously a very difficult decision to make but it's also a decision that you have to make um you have to kind of choose, and again, I'd imagine most, you know, prosecutors will only give you much time to think it over, right? You get given a small window to actually consider your options, and you know, you don't get a chance to actually speak to your co-defenders as well prior to you snitching anything to give them a heads up or any kind of way or to concoct a story. So you're kind of on your own. So hey, he did it. He, he and he's kind of facing the consequence of it now. But I just it's something uneasy about for me seeing the industry blackball him successfully because I think where does it end? If you blackball six nine, do you then blackball the guy that run off with the plug? Do you blackball the guy or girl who purposely sold shitty drugs to people in the ends that then led to various people dying? Do you blackball the person who essentially murks their own friend? Like, how far does it go? Do you blackball the person who mistakenly shoots somebody, um, you know, and they die? Like, or because they're gangster and had a gun, that's okay. Like where they, they honestly pick and choose. And I think that is really the upsetting, not upsetting part. That's the unknowing part because sometimes you get, you know, you start to believe this tale they tell you about the internet, democratizing things and making an even playing field. But it's not really, in it? Especially when it comes to music. Unless, people, unless the industry backs you, it seems like, especially in hip hop, you're kind of on your own. You need to have some kind of level of, not even cosign, but you need to have some people in the industry who have your best to have your best intentions to heart or who are kind of looking out for you right even when you don't know they're looking after you in order for you to get anywhere but it's amazing that some people can get millions of chances i think i can think of somebody like a vic mensa for instance right vic mensa has proved year in year out he's not capable of you know crafting a consistent or a kind of artistic personality or artistic image or persona that he's willing to stick to for more than a year and a half right now he's mr bad boy biker but he's gotten more chances than anybody in the industry and he hasn't necessarily lived up to his potential in any way shape or form um but you know he has the industry co he's got the he's got the links you know signed to the right labels and it sort of kind of works out but then when you're six nine and you you know happen to be you know involved in some actual real life street shit that you had to decide whether or not you're going to spend half the rest of your life in jail or snitch on your friends to get out then suddenly now you get blackboard i guess most of it has to do with his shenanigans outside of that right the fact that he goes around and antagonizes various rappers and essentially turns himself into a wwe character that's you know consistently riling up people on the internet and you know doing a very good job at trolling certain individuals but i don't know i'm just not too sure if this is the right way to go about things i'd much prefer it if we kind of simpler to someone like a like a troy Ave, right when everyone wasn't a fan of troy Ave, i wasn't a fan of cancelling him i just thought hey if you if you fuck with tax stone more and you hate troy Ave, just let the market decide you know he makes pretty crap music he's not a very good rapper um for the most part the market has decided he's pretty irrelevant you just keep moving same with same could happen with six nine if you think his music isn't that good and i think it's been proven now especially since he doesn't have 
the level of ghostwriters or rappers helping him out with his tunes as he did when he was, you know, prior to him getting locked up. The the quality in his music has definitely taken a bit of a dip um, since he's got released from prison because it looks like he's essentially working on his own. Or if he isn't working on his own, he's working with subpar producers and writers. Um, but you should allow the market to decide that. And I think they've spoken anyway because he's supposedly he's projecting to sell 50,000 um units first week which i think is off by 100 because i think he was i think people were, the rumors out there was that like he's going to sell 100 so that it's going to be corrected to about 50 which makes sense in it because you know the music isn't that great and he's not that compelling of an artist after you hear one tune there's not really much more you need to kind of discover from six nine but i don't know man i just felt a bit i don't know i felt the interview was a little bit competitive and unnecessarily so for the wrong reasons but I'll leave in a link below for you to check it out. It's called Six Nine Raps Newly Freed uh, Chart Topping Villain Admits to Everything. So it's a link I'll put in the show notes for you to check out Six Nine interview for you guys to see. Next on the list, we have some very permanent or permanent advice from Daniel um, Sloshman. Or Daniel Slosh, right? Daniel Slosh, Daniel Slosh, who I kind of found, I'm going to say I found him via Burt Kreischer's podcast, a, f- a really funny comedian. And he had a very interesting take when it comes to um, men being accountable to other men when it comes to um, sexual assault. And of course, considering what I spoke about prior when it comes to Eric Marillo, I think it's definitely something that needs to be drummed home for some segment of people out there who still believe that, you know, um i don't know when people get drunk that all bets are off or something you know there's some dudes that have that weird mindset so i'll play a bit of this clip for you now let's put the volume up a little bit there for eight years and he fucking did it there are monsters amongst us and they look like us if you are sick of the narrative that is currently going on about men feel free to change it but you have to get involved don't make the same mistake i did for years which was just sitting back and be like well i'm not part of the problem therefore i must be part of the solution because that's just not how this fucking shit works i I believe and deep down I know that most men of good of course we are but when one in ten men are shit and the other nine do nothing they might as well not fucking be there being good on the inside counts for absolutely fuck all you have to actively be good and get involved instead of having this fucking hero complex of being like I'm gonna beat up a rapist fucking prevent one stop one because I know it can be done because I know how I fucking failed at it because if I'm being 100% honest with myself were there signs in my friend's behavior over the years towards women that I ignored the answer is yes and i guess that's the issue everyone's kind of having with the whole eric miller thing it's like you know he's passed right so you can't speak ill of the dead and it's a tragedy that he passed in the way that he has especially with all this um you know with this dark cloud hanging over him and of course his family are having to replay and see strangers weigh in such as myself while weighing on his legacy and talk ill of him so it's disgusting it's kind of it's horrible thinking about all those things but you know the honest truth of it is that he put his family in this position he's the one that um essentially opened them up to this kind of backlash because of his selfish and you know um disgusting behavior for the most part and it's okay right i think people there's monsters like i said that exist and i think we can deal with it as an you know as adults as a society in the right way but i think when you have people excusing his behavior or kind of glossing over it as um him going into the dark side or having his demons and you know um whatever it may be you're obviously the you're obviously uh, minimizing what he actually did and there's no actual point there's no actual um there's no it doesn't seem like you're trying to make things better for the next person right you're not trying to work things out you're not trying to make sure or ensure that this doesn't happen again to somebody else um you know whether it be the person that's doing it or the person that unfortunately might be the victim you don't want that to happen ever again and of course my thinking is because i've actually you know i've basically you know been obsessed with nightlife for the best part of 10 plus years right you know who the creeps are you know who the people are who you should kind of keep your female friends away from you know who the guys even just if you don't even know who the guys are personally but you know what that type is like so for anyone to sit there and suggest that they had no idea that he might get a little bit handsy he might be a bit you know sloppy when he gets high or drunk or he might put himself in positions where he's you know you know in murky positions it's really really disingenuous we know that happens we know it's the truth we know there's some people in the industry that have certain reputations but you know for 
the um, for the sake of civility and for the sake of just you know privacy you kind of keep some stuff to yourself but there are occasions where you're gonna have to pull them to the side and again that's why i think that's the really annoying thing about this is that all these people eulogizing about eric miller online they're not really his friends like i said they're just eulogizing about him online for the clout they just want to show everybody hey i knew this guy back in the day i was a friend of his before he was famous oh look at me hanging out with him in ibiza but if he was actually his friend you'd want to help him you want to make sure that this person you really regarded highly as a very inspirational dj to you somebody to give you a shot somebody who's supporting you somebody blah, blah whatever he did for you in your life you'd want to make sure that he got the help that was needed or you want to make sure that he kind of faced these demons you'd want to make sure that he kind of sought seek forgiveness for the people that he hurt you'd want to make sure that somewhere shape or form that you had a you had a role to play in making sure that he saw come out this the other side a better person that's what you want to do now it's not self-preservation it's just that's what actual being a friend is will be about and of course if you keep hitting a brick wall you feel as if the guy is not making any kind of change or making an effort to make that change you step away that's what you do but you don't wait until it kind of all comes crashing down and suddenly everyone's coming out of the woodwork remembering how good of a person he was he wasn't that good of a person really it seems like for the most part to, by all accounts and that's the annoying part and again i think for me personally, like, I don't really believe in this idea of utopias, right? Um, but I do kind of have this kind of um, naive, this naive optimism that somehow through all this darkness and these sort of like weird times that we're going through, that there are going to be some lessons learned. And hopefully one of the lessons learned when things do open up is that we obviously do appreciate the fact that clubs and bars are opened and, you know, we don't take them for granted and we kind of um, allow ourselves to be in the moment. We're not kind of on the phone all the time recording crappy video clips that no one's ever going to see, but we're actually sort of immersing ourselves in our environment and we try and look after each other, right? When we're in this place, even if you don't know the person, how many times, you know, I've, I've done it countless of times because I've been in that position myself where you've been sloppily drunk and somebody's given you a glass of water or allowed you to charge their phone on their power pack and allowed you to meet up with or found your friends for you or even just found your phone sometimes right and, and hand it back to you or your id these are all things that you have kind of had done to me that i've kind of now um reciprocated to other people and it feels amazing because you know this is our little community you know this is our little thing this is our sort of like safe haven i know it's dumb to say and it's a little bit um you know it doesn't really it's not it doesn't really make any sense to say nightlife should be safe but i think it should be i think there should be parts of nightlife that should be inherently safe places to go to in the same places you know in the same way um the lgbt community will go to particular nights and places where they're particularly um crafted in a way that appeals to that segment of people it's the same way like in general we should be in a position where we can craft spaces that attract a certain group of people and that we can vet them at the door we can make sure we can police each other in a good and better in a fair and proper way more so than you know hired bouncers can do we can do it man we really can it's going to take a lot of effort but we really can do it let's end this quickly and then he raped my friend and that's on me until the day i die talk to your fucking boys get involved because i'm going to be honest with you lads women are trying their hardest to not get raped like every day <laughs> they try to not get raped i think it's their priority mine's is wi-fi <laughs> i can't do much i just won't do nothing anymore and i'm just suggesting that you do the same and i 100 percent agree with that man 100 percent agree that we just we just we need to pull each other up more um and kind of be the change that was that be the change you want to see whatever that enough saying is whatever anyway we just need to step up in it and kind of um pull up our friends especially the ones in the industry right supposedly they're meant to be if they're, if they're a friend you should be able to pull them up and you know be able to give them a dressing down um in some way shape or forms or call them out of their behavior point blank period it shouldn't be a thing of like waiting until the social media mob comes after them for you suddenly then to start standing up for them online it's like get out of here get out of here and then what else we went to talk about here we'll move on quickly oh <laughs> yeah this is funny so um i'm sure you guys have been keeping up with um the election going over on legions of skanks um where they're essentially voting for a president i think it's going to be president of legion of Skanks for the next two years it started up as a bit of a joke then it got serious and more people got added to it and you know eventually um it turned into a whole thing uh, many laughs were had during this time but i think um one of the most uh, one of the more one of the more questionable events happened a couple of weeks ago or like a week ago 
where unfortunately Big J Okerson was spiked <laughs> by one of his friends. Now, it wasn't in the same way that Burt Kreischer was spiked by Ari Shafir, right? Um, Burt released that podcast, released the podcast, released the podcast, released the podcast, released the podcast. But it was still um, fucked up. Uh, he was spiked with LSD, but it wasn't even something that was meant for him. It was actually meant for Ari, but Ari managed to slip um, the drink back into the vicinity of Shane Gillis and Big J Ogerson. And unfortunately, after Shane took a couple of swigs, Big J turned that drink into his and his night went from good to worse. And, you know, if you are familiar with Legion of Skanks, you know that Big J is a, bloody, he's a sweetheart of a man. Um, he's not somebody that I would expect to be to receive getting spiked well out of that group i think he'd be the person that would probably maybe behind dave smith i don't think someone like dave would appreciate getting spiked um and yeah man i just think he's the wrong person for it to get spiked but seeing how it played out was completely lows i've got a couple of the i think someone actually saved the timestamps on here let me see if i can find them on the video because i think the whole actual occasion was absolutely jokes um there we go here we go so um the old switcheroo stuff from 45 let's go here hey, that was a very very sad oh, amount. i'll make him hold the balloon please <laughs> oh buddy that was see that so that's the drink with the does LSD actually bother jay yeah. well that would hurt it that would hurt anybody that was a very very sad oh, amount. i'll make him hold the balloon and then he switches it and puts it so i, I already of course purposely did spike me think about it because they all knew right they all knew they all knew that LSD was in the beer and then they passed it over to Big J. <laughs> oh, bless his heart. He had no idea what the hell was going on. Please. <laughs> oh. God it's almighty. It's been a rough weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Here, back know, to camera, like, please. Yeah, please. Everywhere I seem to be around Lewis Moore through this entire quarantine, okay. shitty things come my way. Big J drinks my a beer. My team lost the game. He ruined it. Be like, watch this New Jersey resident lose his mind. Oh, cops, cops didn't have to get involved. God. We held our own shit. We, we both did what we needed to do. Right. There's so the Angelo right. Deli normally that stays open and everybody loves oh, till 3 p.m. Oh, my been... God. And then the I'm sorry to the camera. So By the <laughs> way, you did not both do what you needed to do. You both <laughs> failed miserably. And what needed yes. to happen you was you gave it. this man money and he gave... Now, I've got my own spiking story. Um, that was actually one of the first times I actually took MDMA inadvertently so actually um this must have been what early 2000s um you know the, you know i'm that kind of person that kind of keeps asking questions like, oh what is that what does it taste like that? so i guess my friends kind of got agitated and annoyed i kept probing and asking questions so unbeknownst to me um when i went to the toilet they had sprinkled some shit into my beer and i had no idea and i'm quite you know as you can guess from the podcast i'm a pretty hyped um you know uh <laughs> pretty hyped guy for the best of time so you can imagine what mdma must have done to me especially when i didn't know i just remember dancing i was just dancing just going for it caca, 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 caca. left right left right fist bump fist bump fist bump shuffle 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 Ooh, screaming screaming just having the time of my life i just remember that like, just you know biting my ear from my friends talking about all the plans we we're gonna do what festivals we we're gonna go on talking about how much i cherished our friendship and how much i loved them just going on and on and on and then suddenly i realized as i was talking like my jaw started hurting i was like what's my jaw hurting and then you know it just started moving and shaking and moving up and down left to right just swinging I still didn't know what happened and then I think you know I've, 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 later on in the night one of my friends kind of confessed that hey you basically took MDMA he's like what the fuck and by that time I was already super happy and high and just hugging everybody right and I guess so, ev the rest of the ray found out I was on MDMA before I knew right they could just looked at me right see my people's side of CD see my chin swinging but I had no idea none and that was kind of my roofie experience which is a positive one don't get me wrong but I can only imagine what it must be like you know during a pandemic, you know, especially Big J, he hasn't taken the whole, like, you know, not be able to do normal stand-up well. He had a bit of a difficult week too. I think this is the same week that he got pushed off the stage and then suddenly you're with your friends, you know, in a safe space that you deem it to be amongst your fellow comedians and somebody has now roofied you with LSD, which supposedly he's never taken before. He's never had LSD ever in his life. So you can only imagine what that um, that kind of anguish that you must go through. Because I swear, you know, being high LSD isn't MDMA. You're rolling for ages. 
So I can only imagine what that must have felt like. Let me see where it kind of, uh, I think it's 122 in it. Yeah, it's up to up here, but 122 is a bit where we see there, but he's got his roof. He's just like, oh, I feel, feel bad for the guy, man. But this is a weird way to bond as friends, though, isn't it? I guess I know, I know these guys were edgy and shit, but I don't know. I would not want my friends to get in. That was my first occasion. I must have been, I don't know how old I was. I was really young. And it, so it was a fun occasion with you know, no responsibilities, but, you know, working the next day or something and, you know, your mate spiked your drinks with whatever, like, you would hate them. Luckily, they're, you know, they're full-time comics, so it's not really that big of a deal. But still, man, I don't want to be kind of covering my drinks around my friends. I mean, that's odd, isn't it? That is from this. What Lewis have about you? I don't know, Lewis. You got <laughs> one more fucking poll. Do you have another? Oh, it's good. Continue. Go! Oh. Come on. Where is it? Where is it? What am I doing with that hundred? Yeah! Another little where is it? Where is it? provided by David <laughs> Hill. Oh, yeah. oh, Legion of Skanks fans. You There's Ari Shafir pretending like he's high, which is very, you know, a very clever ploy. Pretending that he actually took Came it. Came on a good night. Sorry, Mom, my city. Major problems. I think they need... <laughs> you through a me filter, but the people didn't think so. I've been so serious. Oh, here we go. What's the shiru? Come on, announce it. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It's real. Dude, Lewis, Lewis, minutes ago. There you go. He's oh, been looking at his face. hand like he's on. What's going on? <laughs> Look at this. What do you went? What? No, I told there Jay. Go. He goes, Are we safe? <laughs> yeah, I thought someone did me. <laughs> there is it. Here we go. Personally, did not. Here we go. Where is it? You're right. Hey. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> orange suit. What the fuck are you talking about? Ari, that you're, was, you're, you're no shooting. words. You said you're you're shooting. That was. <laughs> Did you get it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Let's see the bit here. Oh, really? Okay, here we go. Hey? No. Oh. <laughs> no, there's no way. Oh, really? Because I sound like I'm fine right now. Yeah. Uh -oh. Dude, can I tell you nah, something? <laughs> I thought there was something weird in my beard. Do beer I sound weird? Do I no. look? Do I not know what it looks like? Wow. It looks like I'm an acid. Uh -oh. You fucking <laughs> dork. I stand for mayhem. You don't stand for mayhem. Holy Enjoy shit. Your dude, fucking no. life, I've never taken acid in my life. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, <laughs> Lewis! <laughs> Did this. Wait, this happened, dude. Wait, Chris. Really I was like, no way. No, no, that's actually acting? real? Yeah. yeah. Get that's the wheel. I swear to God. Send the Tony Award over yeah. to Ari. That well, was an amazing. How do you feel if that happened to you? If your friend spiked your drink? Would you be friends with them still? Is this this is kind of akin to me in my experience anyway? This is sort of like similar to when um you know you see those pranks with people where they like slap boxes of food. I don't know, if you're eating chicken and chips and your friend comes and kicks it out of your hand. Don't do that to me, right? We're gonna fight if that happens, right? We're gonna get into a fisty cuff. I'm probably gonna headbutt you and you know, ground and pound you to the ground, you know. Like, you know, in more ways than one, right? <laughs> that sounds sus, but regardless, you know what I mean? Like, I don't play those games. I, I, I'm not with those shenanigans, let's say. And again, like, you know, just imagine being a grown up and having your friend spike your drink with LSD. Like, Jesus Christos. Not the fun vibes, man. Not the fun vibes. Have you got any funny spiking stories? Stories where you had a oddly fun time because your friends tried to loosen you up? Let me know in the comments below. Weird way to loosen up your friends, you know. But hey, some people have that kind of weird sort of friendship, I guess. And then we have here. Da, 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 where is it? Oh, yeah, this is a. So, um. I guess you're all familiar with what's going on with Chris D'Elia and you know Brian Callen. You know they're going through their issues at the moment, and um, for the most part, all the comics have essentially what said you know the standard party line. Some people have kind of refused to comment on it, um, and others have sort of like you know just said what they needed to be said in terms of covering the basis. But there was obviously, obviously it's a wider question to be had in terms of, um, especially with the Chris D'Elia story, where essentially he's in trouble because he treated the girls like shit. I think for the most part. Most people were aware that he was a little bit of a, you know, he was a little bit of a hound, right? He went on road and when he was on road, it, it seemed like he didn't waste time trying to, um, you know, uh, liaise with some young females. So that's not the really issue. The issue is that he just didn't treat them that well. But I guess it does really open up a topic in terms of uh, where do you draw the line? in terms of power imbalances, which I'm not really a fan of. I think it's a little bit G-A-Y to be, you know, relate, to be kind of talking about um, 
really messy and awkward sexual encounters as power imbalances i don't really think that's true if anything women usually have the majority of the power in that in that kind of exchange but hey topic for another day but it does kind of open up an interesting question as to how um the celebrity should treat or should kind of conduct themselves when somebody that's infatuated with them who happens to be a fan is also sexually attracted to them like what do you actually do especially when you have you know especially if you're a dude and you have loads of groupies or even the other way way around like how do you kind of carry yourself and what's the best way to go about things in my personal experience or my from my person from my point of view having read loads of books especially the Keith Richards book um, especially the Steven Tyler book from what I've seen groupies were like an instrumental part in the formation of some of your you know your favorite bands they contributed inadvertently to some of your favorite songs and they by and large are the reason why some of your bands are successful as they are right and i think maybe the modern day groupie has changed somewhat but i think the idea of it still being this person who is clearly infatuated by you to the extent that they're willing to exchange sexual favors in order just to get closer to the band I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, especially if it's between two consenting adults. Um, And I also think it's not a bad thing for the actual talent or the person who it is to want to take advantage of this rare moment in time where they happen to be, you know, loved or admired by men and then, you know, kind of lusted upon by women at a certain point of time because i guess it doesn't it doesn't last forever even if you're crystal Lee, whoever you are right you, that kind of hop from thing doesn't last forever so there is a moment in time that you kind of feel as if you need to capitalize on to some certain extent um and it's kind of sort of, maybe stand-up is different but of course in music it is kind of part of the rock and roll persona motif right it's this it's in the same lineage as weighing you know copious amounts of wristbands and covering yourself in tattoos and you know spangly trousers and you know um, high-heeled shoes this is part of it so i think it gets messy it gets weird in my personal for me if it was me and i was chris i'd guess i would just say i wouldn't deal with fans i'll just kind of rule it out completely especially because you know he's re- he's in a really um unenviable position or, you know it depends where, where you look at it. he's one of the only comedians that has a very probably he's only yeah i don't think i can't think of a lot of stand-up comics that have f- a lot of female fans he might be in the minority right so so oh, he's, he's a bit of an anomaly in that way and then he's an anomaly because a lot of the female fans he have are young because he popped off in on vine so that kind of puts him in a weird um conundrum in a weird place but i still think because of how young they might be depending on where you know um depending on how they kind of stumbled upon his content he really does owe it to himself to either be overly nice and overly accommodating and just make them feel really special and make whatever encounter they have to be you know completely pain-free or he owes it to them to kind of push them to a side and say hey this isn't happening because i'd rather you be a fan than us cross that boundary it needs to be one or the other it can't be both unfortunately and um bird crash actually makes that point here um talking to tom segura during two bears one cave i'm gonna quickly play that clip for you when uh all the comic guys they went uh, this is i don't know how even know how to say this but when the, every, a lot of guys were getting lit up for sexual misconduct mm-hmm. and uh one of the things that i heard women say was uh which was is interesting because i've always felt this way but i guess not everyone has and by the way if this is a me too that you're gonna lose almost all male comics not me because i've been married but it's you shouldn't fuck your fans and so like that's the number that's what one, they're saying that's the number one oh you shouldn't be cons- i think i don't i know a female comic said you shouldn't be put under threat by by just one but just because you like someone's comedy doesn't mean they have the right to slide into your dms and try to fuck you oh right and okay. i think a lot of com- a lot of a lot of male comics got into comedy to fuck women that's it i think you're totally right i, I would say a hundred percent and and i feel like we really missed out i missed out so bad we didn't get to ride any of our no. popular but i also think there's a lot of male comics that just get into it just it feels like some of the especially the ones that are constantly on tour they got into it to maybe just escape their demons right or to somehow um occupy their mind especially if they're suffering from some sort of mental illness or some kind of depression or they have some sort of trauma they deal they they've you know they've kind of haven't dealt with they the road is sort of like an escape from that right it's a way to kind of 
reinvent yourself every stop right to reintroduce yourself to new characters who you won't see again um to kind of leave a bit of yourself out there in the abyss so i kind of it's just an odd thing to kind of rectify from the outside looking in and part of me also thinks like it's also similar to workplaces right you shouldn't really get with anybody at work but how many times have you been in what how many offices have i been in where there's you know been more than two couples plenty and it makes complete sense right spending what eight hours a day in an office right especially if you're a small team um working with people that are of age right for the most part um you're bound to kind of develop some feeling for some people you're bound to look at some people you know in a weird different light but like, hmm do you know like it's bound to happen because you, because you, it's a rare occasion where you actually get to know somebody, you know, over a long period of time, right? This is not like some Tinder hookup or someone sliding into your DM. It's actually somebody you actually, you know, you sort of like uh, built some rapport with. You've kind of built a friendship and that's maybe led to other things. So that happens quite often. So I'd imagine if anything, these groupies or these fans that are sliding into some of these comedians DMs probably know them, especially from the content they consume of theirs on podcasts and stuff, they probably know them a lot more than their own friends, right? They're, they're obsessed with these people. They follow them, you know, wherever they go across the country. Um, they're always on their Instagram. They listen to every podcast they're on. Like they're really consuming every bit of content they put out there. So it can be difficult if you're um, the talent or whatever to suddenly then step away and be like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to get involved in this person because they're a fan. It's just difficult to pull that plug. It really is. Again, obviously, this isn't justifying going and hooking up with bloody children, do you know what I mean? Or purposely trying to hook up with somebody that's um, that could pass for somebody that might be underage, because that's really weird, especially if you think that might happen with Crystalia. But I don't know, man. It's an interesting topic, really, because, again, I don't think a lot of these guys have I suffer. I think a lot of them probably have to fend off housewives. But it is interesting to think, especially with these newer sort of like Instagram comedians, how will they handle the fame, how will they handle having groupies that actually look like groupies, right? And not just, you know, middle-aged women who kind of want to get out for the night and have a bit of cheeky fun. I wonder. I bloody wonder. Anyways, I think that might be it, you know. That's episode one. That's episode one. I wish. That's episode 369 there. It went hour in already. I think I'm going to call it a day right there. Why not? Let's just keep that on the buzzer. So, if it's your first time watching the show, please make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. Um, please also so support the show via Patreon, patreon.com for slash Agostino. For little as one dollar per month, you get access to my entire library as well as this full audio podcast for your listening pleasure only through patreon so make sure you click that patreon link in the description or in the pinned comments wherever you might be listening to it and i guess i'll see you guys again tomorrow um i actually got a live stream scheduled i'm going to be putting out a dj live stream that i'm actually going to be doing live so make sure you keep abreast of that i think that's going to be having on wednesday if i've got a set for wednesday but i'll obviously send out some alerts of that when that happens but apart from that thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company and i'll see you guys again very very soon usually tomorrow but most will be tomorrow but anyway take care peace bye